my friends just good enough to have all of us moderating today. This is we're just going to talk about some updates if you're all in the right room. We're also going to have Matt Lawford talk about some innovations we have in the unit. Make sure you've signed up. Um, PDHs will be given at the end of the hour. Uh, and as a reminder, the policy is that everyone has to wear a mask unless you're speaking for eating. Um, first up, we have Leah. She's going to talk about our guidelines update. And I'll let her take it from here. Oh, Steve, I'm sorry. Steve and Morgan, the unit head, he's coming up to speak first. Yeah, I was going to just sit back and enjoy some good old articles here in the technician about our Wolfpack women. <laughs> on the sequential women in the time. Um, one more time. Uh, thank you all for being here. It's probably, uh, I hope that it's going to be a very exciting, well, I don't know how exciting you're talking about guidelines here. Yeah. 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 Right after lunch, but thank you all for being here. I think you've heard a lot about uh, the delegated authority that DFT's been given. Uh, one of those things with the uh, oversight agreement with FHWA is actually our guidelines. And if you look at the very end of that document, you'll see that listed there. Um, there's also other things involved, um, sort of by reference of the guidelines and through other agreements through FEMA, um, you know, EPA. They go all the way down to delegated programs with our floodplain mapping program that's uh, in-house and, and also our stormwater program. And obviously we uh, maintain our guidelines and it, it comes to... Uh, Drainage and drainage law, that's something that we certainly um, take very seriously and we're the ones called on the stand a lot of times to answer those questions. So we take our guidelines very seriously and thank you all for being here today. I know Leah will lead you through uh, a really good presentation. So, uh, and thanks again. I want to thank KCI particularly, and Leah particularly for helping us. This was uh, supposedly a small lift. On, on our latest little flight update, but we also have this larger update that she's going to share with you about how we're going to be more strategic moving forward with further updates with our guidelines. And, and also, we need all of you all to give input as we move forward and make this a better process uh, because as you start using all of these QCQA checklists and using our manual and it says this or it says that, we need to understand how it really is working in practice so we can continue making it better. So thank you all for being here. Leah, thank you. I'll let you have that now. to develop a roadmap uh, for future updates, uh, including not only the guidelines, but the Highway Stormwater Program, Highway Floodplain Program, and all the other various internal hydraulic documents. Uh, ultimately, the goal is to create a living document online so that future updates are easy to incorporate and we don't have to go and wait five years for another one. Uh, Originally, when KCI was brought on board, uh, we were tasked with examining in the existing guidelines, creating a survey uh, to put out to the engineering community as a whole to identify potential needs and additional guidance that might be needed, and also to review other DOT guidance documents to see what they were doing and if it was easy to incorporate some of these, what they're doing to DOT guidelines. So, for the 2022 guidelines, not a lot of content has changed, but it's more of a reorganization to better align with the PDN. Um, basically, DOT wants to make hydraulic design decisions earlier in the planning process and to identify risk items that could potentially affect project delivery. So, as you see, this is the list of uh, topics that uh, were identified in need of further updates or clarifications from the 2016 guidelines. All the items in bold are included in the 2022 update. So back in uh, September of 2020, we put out a survey to the engineering community as a whole. Uh, it included private engineering firms, academia, other state agencies, and NCDOT staff. The survey asked respondents to provide feedback on issues and 
corrections that might be needed to not only the guidelines but the highway stormwater program and the highway floodplain program. Respondents were asked to identify critical gaps um, that were in need of update and provide need of a back that might also need to be update. We had 82 responses with the majority of them coming from private engineering firms. So, with the PDN, we're moving towards kind of a performance-based standard. And one of the topics we wanted to put out there to the engineering community was to kind of gauge the level of interest with uh, the private engineering firms of whether or not this is something they wanted to look at. And overall, everybody said, yes, let's do this. Um, it allows the designer a little bit more flexibility in the design process. But obviously, with moving to a performance-based standard, there could be some potential for pitfalls. Some of these that were identified were needing to clearly identify the level of risk associated with the complexity of the project, distinguishing between project delivery risk and design risk, and try to avoid designing to the minimum extent possible. So, all of these things, all these topics came out of that survey. Um, obviously, can't do them all at once, but the top five that came out were the 2D modeling guidance, hydroplaning guidance, uh, addressing climate change and resilience, coastal modeling, and performance-based standards. All the items highlighted in bold are included in the 2022 update. The um, 2D modeling and resiliency, uh, they're under development currently and they will be addressed in future updates. And then after the survey, hydraulics unit continued and said, well, we've identified some more things that need to be updated. <laughs> Again, a lot of items here. Uh, the items in bold are in the 2022 update, uh, and all of these items at some point will be addressed in future updates. So I'm not going to go into a whole lot about the PDN. Um, I'm pretty sure everybody here knows kind of what it is. Basically though, how it ties in is the hydraulics unit was tasked with making sure that all of its internal documents align with the stages of the PDN. And this is, I figure everybody's familiar with it now, this is the map of all the PDN activities that could apply when developing or delivering a project. Uh, the specific items that relate to hydraulics in the PDN include the hydraulic planning report, the preliminary stormwater management plan, concurrence meetings, hydraulics field inspection, hydraulic pre-design meeting, FEMA compliance, drainage summary sheets, stormwater control measure summary sheets, stormwater management plan, and permit drawings. So as you can see on this diagram, all of those diamonds are major decision points. And what the hydraulics unit was finding that these decisions needed to occur earlier in the design process, and part of the update is to provide more guidance for these design discussions earlier in the planning stages. So, out of the PDN, these are the list of items that were specifically in need to make sure that they aligned with the new PDN. The items in bold are actually new topics that did not exist previously in the 2016 guidelines. As you can see, there are a lot of topics that were covered in this light update, but generally they all relate to the new performance standard for the PDN. So when we started this process, we did we were aligning it with the PDN version 2. There's now a version 2.1 and probably more coming up needed. Okay, so that's how we got here. Now we're actually going to go over what has changed. Like Stephen said, the 2022 is a light update. It's not intent intended to be a comprehensive update. It's only designed to address the critical needs that were identified and make sure that the guidelines align with the PDN. So the major changes, the manual is now going to be online, broken out by chapter. And I'll show you guys here in a minute. But this is intended to make it easier to update in the future. Uh, instead of revisions issued to an entire document, future chapters will be uh, revised by chapter. The date at the bottom will change by chapter. So always look to the website for the most current version. 
Each chapter will have a revisions table at the beginning that highlights the changes that were made. For future revisions, content will also be highlighted in the body text. It was not done for this go around because we've changed so much in the format and some of the wording for each chapter that it would just been all, all yellow. Uh, the appendix and the, uh, the appendix and references are now included in the chapters themselves. All relevant tables and figures are embedded in the relevant chapter. Any outside documents are provided as a reference and is linked into the chapter. And then there will be a new website and it's coming soon. Uh, be on the lookout for an announcement from the hydraulics unit. If you haven't done so, go ahead and go to the Connect website and stay in the flow. Uh, the, old web, the old link, if you have it bookmarked, will direct you to the new 2022 guidelines website and the 2016 will be housed in an archive section. Okay, so now I'm going to go through the major changes. Um, the look and feel of the guidelines has definitely changed. If you're familiar with the 2016, it's going to look a lot different, but the content really hasn't changed that much. But there are definitely some specific chapters that have had a pretty decent overhaul. Chapter 3 is one of them. Chapter 3 guidance has been rewritten to accommodate changes to the hydraulic planning report, which replaces the hydraulic or the preliminary design report. The HBR provides a record for hydraulics relating to planning information that will assist in determining project impacts, cost, level of service, risk, resilience, and scope of work in later project phases. HBR will also include items such as existing drainage issues, existing PMPs, resiliency needs, hydraulic commitments, risk identification, avoidance and minimization efforts, preliminary hydraulic structure recommendations, and preliminary hydro planning assessment if needed. There is also an accompanying HPR template spreadsheet that will assist you in your process. The chapter also provides guidance for the hydraulic field review and the preliminary stormwater management plan. I will going to tell you that the preliminary stormwater management plan is separate from the HPR. This chapter also goes into gives the designer a flexibility to consider a higher level of service than what is the standard for important transportation corridors. In planning stages, the design engineer should consider factors such as inundation probability, criticality of commercial and first responder access, climate change, and access to critical infrastructure. The guidelines also allow the designer to maybe consider a lower level of standard if warranted. Chapter 3 clarifies the definition of a major stream crossing. It's now defined as an effective waterway opening of 30 square feet. And then chapter Appendix D has been replaced with the HPR and the HPR template. The preliminary hydraulic field checklist is now included at the end of the chapter for easy reference. And Appendix E, which was the VSR, CSR, and detour keys, have been updated and links have been provided in the chapter. And finally, there's also new guidance on the merger 2A field meetings. Yep. Chapter 4 has been completely revised. Includes updated and detailed guidance for design recommendation plan set and a new section on the long way to hydroplane. The hydroplaning risk assessment tool has been revised to incorporate the latest hydroplaning guidelines and clarify the procedure for the analysis. There's also detailed guidance for the hydraulic design engineer on preparing and attending the hydraulic pre-design meeting. 4B merger meeting guidance that was previously available on the Connect website has been has had some minor updates, has been incorporated as a linked document into Chapter 4. And Finally, former Appendix B, which was the drainage study and hydraulic design checklist, has been split out into two different documents. It's now the design, drainage design, field inspection checklist, and the pre-design checklist. Okay, Chapter 5 and 6 of the 2016 guidelines have been combined into one chapter, which is now Chapter 5. 
Minor edits and clarifications have been made throughout the chapter. Uh, major changes is that all references to hazardous spill basins have been removed, including references to appendix mode. And minor changes uh, include uh, red line drainage plans uh, and items picked up during the hydraulic field visits. This chapter also includes guidance for completing the new 3D series hydraulic summary plan sheets, including the drainage summary sheet and the stormwater control measure summary sheets and their deliverables. Chapter 6 is now the resilience chapter. So the language that was originally in the 2016 guidelines in chapters 3 and 8 that dealt with climate change and extreme weather events were moved to this chapter. And then the hydraulics unit, which I think Matt's going to talk a little bit more about later, uh, they're currently developing policies addressing climate change and extreme weather events, and these will be updated in a future revision. Chapter 13 has been completely revised to align with the PDM. Chapter 13 provides an overview of NCDOT's Highway Stormwater Program and discusses federal and state regulations that necessitate NCDOT's NPDS Post-Construction Stormwater Program. It highlights some tools and guidance that NCDOT has developed. It also provides a list of considerations for post-construction discharges, water quality standards, and maintenance concerns. This chapter also provides user guides and links to the BMP toolbox, the BMP decision support matrix, preliminary stormwater management plan, the NC Seldom catalog, and the final stormwater management. So chapter 14 itself hasn't really changed. Uh, it only had some minor edits. The two biggest changes are the two new outside documents that are linked to this chapter. The guidance for the 4C merger meeting that was previously available on the Connect site has received some uh, minor updates and now is incorporated into chapter 14 as a linked document. And old, sorry. Old Appendix P, which was the permit drawing guidelines, has been updated to reflect current practices. Revisions include current CAD practices as well as some little guidance that better align with the PM. Chapter 15 has been updated to reflect the new NCDOT NC FMP MOA. Uh, the hydraulics unit gave a uh, presentation on this late last year, highlighting the new changes. So if you haven't seen that, we we'll review that uh, presentation on the hydraulics connect site. The main reason for this revision was due to an error in the 2016 MOA guidance, which allowed for a rise on a detailed study, which is not allowed by NFIP regulations. The major edits include new guidance rounds the base flood elevation to the hundredth of a foot to be consistent with FEMA and reduces the number of compliance types from 12 to 3. Some other changes include developing mitigation strategies and evaluations for maintenance activities in this FEMA special flood hazard area, guidance for temporary encroachments in a regulatory floodway, emergency replacement structure guidance, and a new Standalone document, the Coordination and Compliance Plan. This provides the hydraulic engineer with technical guidance on criteria for state floodplain compliance and NFIP approval, modeling standards, and common modeling issues and single procedures. Chapter 16 is now the Coastal Hydraulic Design Guidance Chapter. It provides high Engineers, important considerations for projects in the coastal environment, starting with, with conditions that require the expertise of a coastal engineer. It introduces topics such as determining an appropriate level of analysis, considering making risk-based determination for sea level rise, and the use of titled items and tied gauges. Previous section in Chapter 8 that was related to scour for coastal and tidal bridges has been moved to this chapter. And this chapter is still being revised and future updates are coming in the future. Okay. Let's see if I can bring up the new website. Okay, so this is what the new website is going to look like. 
so the chapters are now going to be broken out and all of the associated documents are going to be linked that are linked to the chapter are going to be as part of this drop down menu. Uh, common material uh, will be over here to the right. Uh, so if you can't remember what chapter the HPR template is in, it will be over here for you. And then additional resources, archive guidelines, and memos related to the hydraulics uh, will all be in these tab sections. So click on chapter. You see, this is what the new chapter is going to look like. You're going to have the revision sheet that tells you everything that's changed from the previous version. Table of contents. And it goes into material. There are hot links and things that will link to other chapters or outside documents embedded in the document. And then each chapter at the very end is going to have a reference section. You're going to have all your references for the chapter in that chapter itself. And there is going to be additional documentation, which also provides links for all the outside material that is associated with that chapter. OK, so where do we go from here? Uh, I know this is hard to read now. Uh, show a couple of this in a little bit, but this is the uh, future update workflow for the guidelines. The intent is to provide updates on a two-year cycle. The workflow is divided into four swim lanes, each dedicated to responsibilities and varying timelines associated with each. For the sources tab, these are where updates may arise, including external sources, such as those from the peer program and the PDN process, as well as internal sources. The Hydraulics Leadership and Steering Committee provides ongoing oversight for guidance and update process, including prioritization and initiation of specific updates. The Leadership Committee will maintain ongoing inventory of revisions and need their future updates and new areas of guidance. And this is going to be housed in what we're calling the parking lot. It's intended that the guideline updates process is a continuous improvement depending on the technical demands and complexity of time updates. Hydraulics Unit will look to engage outside groups including ACEC, ENC, other government entities, and private engineering firms during the review cycle to get comments and suggestions for content and updates. The Express updates from Lane or for those updates that have been determined by the leadership committee to be within the technical capability of internal hydraulic staff and assigned private engineering firms for things like minor corrections or clarifications to the existing guidance. The expressed updates are anticipated to go on a shorter time frame, typically three to six months. It could also be used for topics that have been extensively researched by other agencies or DOTs and can be easily incorporated into DOT guidelines. And finally, the last one lane is for the technical advisory groups, which are for updates that are going to take more time and more research or new areas of guidance that may require several areas of expertise. Leadership Committee will assign subject matter experts to develop the content related to the topic because these updates are anticipated to be more complex, they're also probably going to take a little bit longer, so we're anticipating two years or more to develop content. So this is a good blow up of that workflow. So this is where the sources of updates will come in. It's going to be uh, either from a clear website, PDN process, email, or any other contact, but this is where Suggestions, clarifications, things for updates are going to fall. And it's going to come over here to what's our, known as our parking lot. So for the next review cycle, the Hydraulics Leadership Committee will gather all of those recommendations and determine which need to be updated for this review cycle. We're going to look to collaborate with outside entities in the engineering community to get suggestions 
Uh, we've talked about possibly doing lunch and learns or work group working sessions to get feedback during this review cycle to get content. So if the hydraulics unit determines that the update is going to be easy and we can easily incorporate it, then it will fall into the express updates. And then the leadership committee will assign either staff internally or a private engineering firm to help develop that content. It'll go through the review cycle and then go back out to the leadership community for final approval. If it is a more complicated update, it's going to come over here to this uh, technical advisory group where the leadership committee will assign what we're going to call a champion of that. It will fall into one of these uh, subject matter expert groups and depending on the complexity, these might have other disciplines associated with them, uh, other engineering firms, basically whatever we need uh, to develop this content. They're going to go and do peer research from other DOTs and other agencies to see if there is existing guidance out there that can be incorporated. And it's going to go through the internal review process before it comes back out to the leadership committee. Back out to the leadership committee for final approval. During this, there might come up instances where maybe you can identify future updates that are needed. So these would actually go back into the parking lot for the next round. So it comes back out, content has been developed, it's going back out to the leadership committee for final approval. Um, if it ends up, uh, the new content requires updates to the PDM or Atlas or to other NCDOT disciplines, the leadership committee will alert them and make sure that those get incorporated. And then we start the next review cycle. So as Stephen mentioned, the 2022 guidelines are considered a light update. We understand that there will be comments and suggestions to make it better. Hydraulics Unit is always looking for input and unsolicited input is always welcome. Comments can be made through the CLEAR website the Hydraulics Unit Connect site, and you're always welcome to email your favorite Hydraulics Unit staff. With that, Secretary's um, uh, discussion yesterday about resiliency. I thought it'd be good to just give you guys a in the room, talk about some of the stuff we've been working on with, with resiliency. And um, so I'm going to hit you with a lot of stuff. Stephen looked at my slides and said, You got a lot of slides there. Um, but anyway, we're going to go through it and then um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do the best we can. It's going to feel like a fire hose, I think, a little bit, but it'll be all right. Okay, so just going back to risk, resilience, and innovation. So, you know, risk means the positive or negative effects. You know, and, and Rhonda talked about this yesterday about, you know, it can either be um, something that's um, an opportunity or, or something that's, you know, a, a threat, right? And so, you look at that and we look at risk. And then resilience, um, looking at that, and this is the, the uh, definition we've adopted as a department, means the ability to anticipate, plan for, adapt to changing conditions and withstand, respond to, recover rapidly from disruption. So this has been, become a, a large focus of the department and where we're headed. Um, in fact, you know, it's been such a large part of that that, let's bring it around here a little bit more. Um, but 
adopted a resilient policy at the department. This was just signed recently by the uh, secretary, as well as the chief engineer, our CEO of Bone Memory, and then Chris Warner, Warner as well. But basically, it directs the, the, the department to, to deal with both natural and uh, human uh, threats and develop a program to, to facilitate how we respond to those and build a more resilient uh, department. And we're doing that through a strategy. We're, we, we established our policy. We now have programs that we're developing in that resiliency program. It's a partnership between Transportation Planning Unit, um, Technical Services, the Hydraulics Unit, um, as well as our uh, Policy Unit. Um, but it includes the entire department. We've got a, a, a leadership executive committee that meets with the resilience team, as well as a, as a project uh, management team, an oversight team. So, um, and we're looking to see how we can best position ourselves as the department to um, address resiliency. And all this comes out of the uh, governor's executive order 80 that you guys um, remember that I believe back in 2019. So I want to talk a little bit about innovation and where we're going. Because doing resiliency requires innovation. And this comes from like Tom Herman. I really enjoyed his slides. He was back and gave his presentation about resist change, you die. Accept change, you survive. If you lead change, you thrive. And an innovator is a risk taker. They, need, they build relationships, engage in deliberate practice. And there's a lot, I look around the room and there's just a lot of innovators in here, right? You have to be in this changing environment. It seems like it's going to warp speed these days, but we got to respond to and not react to that change. We need to take um, life, um, uh, lifelong learn, learn, learning and be a little disruptive at times and then just foster a supportive environment. And then also, the impact of innovation is transformative, but it also it's incremental. It's noteworthy, emerging, and disruptive. And one of the uh, people in this room that reminds me is Leilani. She's pretty disruptive. So. <laughs> 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 oh, but, but today I want to talk about a couple of things about the risk. We've got a lot of risk, though. I mean, the biggest one, I think, honestly, folks, in here is the workforce. We've got, I remember, ACEC, the President ACDC was talking to the Transportation Summit, like we have like an 82,000 uh, engineer deficit by 2030. I mean, that's significant. And you look at the amount. So I think one of our biggest risks to the department and just our delivery of projects is that workforce. So as we can work through that as well as other challenges, I think it's really important to think about. But I'm going to hit about on some of these things in yellow today with design, increasing rain, rainfall, sea level rise, legislation, scour, some of these things, so quite a few topics there. But I was thinking about talking about the great innovations we've been doing with hydroplaning. Matt York, are you in here? He's, in the, he's actually leading the, another room. Yeah. So and we've got outlet analysis. We've got firms helping us out with that. From the horn, the planning report. Oh, we've got ORD, uh, drainage utilities, um, work that we're doing. Um, what, are, you, are you in here? And then state flood plan compliance with Brian and the work he's done there. So we'll do these lunch and learns, but we truly are working as a matrix organization. Steve Morgan's our CEO, leading us through this stuff and, and in working with different entities of the department. And the other one I left off here just all the amazing work that our you know, stormwater group is doing with Andy McDaniel under his leadership. So just a lot going on. Well, let's jump into resiliency, and I want to talk a little bit about resiliency and design and how we're looking at that. Um, it's important for us to think about when we're doing, this is a bridge project. This is an NC24 um, between Clinton and, and I-40, and, and uh, Matt York is working on this project in our eastern group. But we're, we're, make, we're replacing the bridge, but we realized there was, there was two events, Matthew and Florence, at this bridge. The, the floodplain got over top and we lost the road twice. And so that, you know, that's a... A, a reoccurring damages that are occurring. So as we look in the future and look at our damages on our system, we're doing our projects, we need to look if we have these reoccurring and then see if we can do something about it. Because by doing some, and we're working with, um, John's in here with his team and on some um, geogrid systems that we can put on that downslope to 
protect that when it overtops again, so we harden it, right? And so when the water rolls over that again in the future, we'll be protected and we won't lose the road and we won't lose utilities and it, it should be much more resilient. The other one that you've heard talked about a little bit is our I-95, and this project was um, pretty significant. The whole I-95 corridor basically from uh, Lumberton all the way up to Benson, right, is being re redone. And when, after we had Florence, the, the, the uh, um, our, our secretary, Jim Trogdon, um, and, and Chris Warner, they wanted to do a, a resilience, uh, resiliency study on this, flood frequency, uh, flood resiliency study. Look at those vulnerable areas that occur. And so, and then in that analysis, you know, Lumberton, we lost the I-95 for over a week during those events, and so it's a significant issue. So we just looked at better ways to get up ahead of this. So we actually set up a, um, these were the, the goals of that, was just to make it more resilient. Um, uh, Lumber River Bridge replacement that was flooded, and then Five Mile and some areas up here along on Area C that were, were flooded and inundated as well. We want to limit those long-term impacts. So we went through a large-scale modeling in the planning side. This is all before, this is during planning. So we did, we did a 600 square mile 2D rain on grid model for that entire watershed that contributes to this location. And then we updated the, the hydrology in that area. And then the whole purpose was that we talked to the, the contractors and they wanted us to set the profile of the road before the design bid procurement, right? So we went through all of that. We sized the culvert, sized the bridge, so then we, when we got the design build, all that was taken care of. There was also a risk, of, uh, we were trying to minimize risk too to um, delaying the project due to it being a, uh, a build grant project, which has a specific timeline that we have to deliver the project. So that helped us as well. But right now then we have a project, we have a, a system down there that should, it's designed in a hundred year, and even a foot and a half of freeboard, but also that new design should basically perform during a Matthew and Florence event in the future without any uh, result in um, uh, mobility or connectivity. Um, the other thing I want to talk about a little bit is resiliency and design with inundation. Um, we have a lot of inundation during these events. Um, the top picture there is just water flowing over a roadway section, and the other one's NC12 there. So how are we looking at that? So we've um, run, worked with our, our partners in the special engineering firms to basically navigate net NABD at zero all the way to we've actually taking it to 30. And we've looked at all the roadway inundation for the entire 23 coastal counties. So this is a tool now that's available. It'll be available on Atlas. We're going to partner with Lonnie and do that in there as well. But we also have a web-based system that we're working to get, working with IT to get more efficient. So you can take that information and do studies and planning and that type of thing. So pretty um, helpful tool. The other thing we did with our partnership with emergency management, we've taken the road inundation uh, layer. During, after Florence, we took our 80,000 miles of highway and our LIDAR data and then has a, we have a roadway elevation ribbon. And so we took that and we took all that information and overlaid it on the entire flood studies across the state. So we now have 10, 25, 50, 100, and 500 year uh, flood inundation information for our entire roadway network. So that's another powerful tool that will be in Atlas as well as in a, in a uh, road based system in the future. Rainfall, we gotta talk about rainfall. So our, our Atlas 14 has not been updated since 2014, 2004. So we've missed all those uh, incredible hurricanes and uh, more intense rainfall events and that type of thing. So we're working with federal highways right now in the four state, Delaware, Maryland, North Carolina, and Virginia. It's a million dollar study to get the Atlas 14 updates going. So that's coming, that'll be done in about two years. And so that's a, a partnership. The other interesting thing, um, and this is just some more information about that. I'm going to, have to go ahead and just skip over that. But it's going to totally update the entire Atlas 14 um, information. Um, the other interesting thing, though, in the uh, IAJA, the Infrastructure Act, there's about a half a billion dollars going to NOAA. And they're talking about doing Atlas 14 for the entire country. And so, and then also putting some additional climate adaptation and non stationarity information in there as well. So. That's coming, that would probably be done by fiscal year 25, uh, 26. So that would be really helpful as well. Go ahead.
But what about the non-stationarity and climate adaptation? You know, where are we going with this? What's it going to look like in 2100? So we're looking at that as well. Um, you'll see this, this is a research project we're doing at NC State right now. Um, and those are all climate scientists, right? Who, who thought that we'd be doing with climate scientists as a civil engineer? But we are. And we're talking to them about what are these storms going to look like in the future? What are our rainfall patterns going to look like? So we're looking at the global climate models. We're looking at the different ensembles of these models. We're looking at the different precipitation amounts that might be projected to come here and looking at the difference in what those models would provide for us for as far as the design and things. So that's some of the work we're doing with um, Jerry Bowden. And then um, we're also working with Dr. Lackman, and this is a scenario of uh, Floyd in 1999, and this is what it's going to look like in, in 2100. So, significant amount of uh, aerial distribution, and as well as some additional intensity. So, we're summarizing that information um, and looking at what the results of the, the rainfall totals are, the maximum accumulation are, and, and, and just seeing what, what impacts might come. So, we can feed this kind of information into like that 2D model that I showed you for lunch. Um, and then um, flow plate management also had a lot of a lot of rate on grid models that we're trying to leverage for additional um, analysis as well. Um, moving to sea level rise, we've done quite a bit of work right now on a probabilistic sea level rise study um, for Wilmington, Beaufort, and Duck, and it's a it's going to provide a, a probabilistic distribution of le water level hazards, including sea level rise and storm surge, and it will help us plan better the coastal region. So um, it'll, it'll determine the probabilistic likelihood of floods reaching a range of elevations throughout the next eight years. And it accounts for the random variability of storm surge events as well as significant epistemic uncertainty in the sea level rise projection. So we're looking at the COP study, the non-exceedance probability curves, to come up basically a table that gives you a stage and then the annual likelihood of flooding. So we can use this more to basically quantify if we're doing, you know, a secondary route or a primary route, you know, what is the likelihood? So we're using this kind of information to help us, like, design the alligator river bridge on 64 and things like that. So it gives it, but it's based on probability statistics. This is for RCP 4.5. We also do it for RCP 8.5 to look at how those impacts would, would affect us. And then just talking about storm resilience, we have to respond to these storms, and we need to look at how is it, Operational come up. This came really uh, uh, became very important during. I think we saw we saw Matthew, and I think Jay and I were pulling our hair out on that one. And then um, you know, as well as operations and just just tracking those the 730 or so washed out um, structures. And then then came you know said so, okay that's a once in a lifetime event. And then two years later Florence comes right We're in the same situation. Not quite as many structures, but. It was a big lift. So, you know, how do we respond better now? How do we get some information out there? Or how do we look historically at this? So, we've worked with uh, emergency management and their team of, uh, of consultants to, to look at what we call Feynman for transportation. So, um, you guys might be aware of the Feynman system that the PM works for buildings and impacts the buildings and their floods. This is the impact for roads and bridges that we're running. And so, we've, we've uh, developed this site. It's a two year pilot. And we've, um, we're making pretty good progress on it. Here's some metrics. We've got 50 sites in there now. Uh, it's 2,200 2, miles of uh, roadway systems, um, about 2,800 square miles or 2,600 square miles. Um, we've got 100 miles of bridges, and then we've got 12 historic events in there. So, as the, if you can go in there and look at, okay, what did, especially on like the News Corridor, you can look at Floyd, you can look at Fran, you can. Matthew and see kind of what the road inundation was. And then during the event, it'll actually do the forecasting if it's a National Weather Forecast Center, and then you do scenario testing and things like that. So um, it's a new tool and it really helps us. The other one we're working on is Time and Teach Surge. Totally different system. It's using um, SARA. Um, basically, it's running on uh, the AdSERT models that Dr. Ludic uh, has developed, Dr. Lamb at UNC, Renzi. We're working with them to optimize the system where, as these hurricanes are approaching, like 40 hours ahead, we'll know what roads are going to be impacted, right, by these models that are coming. So we're taking that road elevation model, the output from that, and then overlaying the wave height and the, 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 the 
for large surface elevation on that roadway network to better understand what bridges are going to be impacted and what um, uh, roads are going to be impacted. And then here's just some general metrics on that as well. So about 10,000, 11,000 miles of highway in there, 199 bridges, and then we've got historical flood events in there as well. And so that one's a, that, that, that system, we haven't tested it yet, so we're hoping, well, we're really not hoping that we get it, but hopefully this will keep it from happening. So, um, the other one we're doing is, is trying to put some redundancy in the system, which is bridge watch. It's a, a software as a solution, and we're partnering with US Engineering Solutions to deliver this. And BridgeWatch basically monitors our, our structures over water. We've integrated gauges with it at, at about 300 locations. There are 90 locations. And then but it also monitors the rainfall over the watershed's tributary. So if it, it hits a certain threshold of rainfall, it sends an alert, and we know that there's certain vulnerability at that site that we really want to monitor. And so there's just a distribution of all those bridges now that we're monitoring. And we're working on the, the reporting and data analytics behind this to better inform executive leadership as well as those emergency managers that need to know this information here in the event. And working with our structured management team as well to um, you know, look at scout critical bridges um, and, and substructure issues and other things. So that we can, uh, and then we can report on it from a, a, a transportation asset management process as well. And then getting to uh, quantitative resilience, you know, we're looking at all these, these vulnerabilities and threats and hazards, but we need to quantify them in some way. So we're currently working on vulnerability assessments on different corridors across the state. And um, the, this one, I just want to highlight this one, US 74. So some of the study questions, you know, how, how will future traffic be impacted by climate-related events? You know, which infrastructure assets will cause the most disruptions? Which assets are most important? Um, and the bottom line, you know, how will vulnerable populations be impacted by future climate changes? And that type of thing. So that this is the type of thing that this type of um, swim, this modeling can do for us. And so we we developed a digital twin of this whole corridor. We've got 331 HEC-RAS models in there. We've got 17 rain on grid models. We're using Adsert and Telemac. And then we've got about 1.1 million people there. There in that corridor, 4,000 structures. You know, so we're, we're looking at that whole corridor, and then we're running a climate scenario on it. Up 2020 to 2060, and seeing what the impacts of that are. So. And just to quickly get through some legislation, you know, why are we doing all this work? We're really preparing for that, for the IJA and, and some of the opportunities are there with resilience funding. So a significant amount of that, that work, Infrastructure Investment Act, is, is centered around resilience and thinking about it. So I just highlighted some of the things in here that are pretty important and we'll, we'll use this type of technology to go after those, those um, uh, grants to just you know, make our system more resilient. And then in the last budget, North Carolina budget, there's a significant amount of resiliency work in there as well. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about that flood resiliency blueprint um, that's going on. Um, and then there's, there's a transportation infrastructure resiliency fund that will be uh, managed by emergency management and then just some other, other things in there as well. So um, again, the General Assembly is pretty focused on making our state more resilient when it comes to these natural hazards. And then just want to emphasize too, research. Um, we're doing a lot of research. And if you haven't, I would check out TRB and CHRP and some of the work that's going on there in Federal Highways right now. Federal Highways is redoing a lot of their documentation like HEC 25, HEC 23, and those are, those are rolling out. And so when you're working on scour and things like that, Check those, those documents out. There's a lot going on. And then the ASHTO is redoing their drainage manual as well. And that'll be coming out in a few years here as well. So, and then I just wanted to just let you know, we're also looking at doing research on, uh, you know, where these washouts occur. And this is just some of the work that NC State's doing, Barbara Dahl and her team. And we're just learning more about um, where these washouts occur, how they occur, you know, and then how can we, can we predict them? And then, so we're using models to do that and, um, and looking for really resilient routes, like where these resilient routes are that we can then, some, you know, look at the, the assets along those and then optimize their performance along that corridor. And so we're learning some really interesting things, and this is just a graph of that. But a lot of the failures are on those maintenance pipes, uh, non-MDS pipes. 
And so here's just some the preliminary results. The really cool thing about this too, and this is from Steven's leadership, we're now partnering with SAS to really data mine this stuff and get into big data. And so that, is, that has been a huge, huge help. And we're, we're learning a lot through that as well. So appreciate Steven's leadership to, to make that connection. And then this, this, I just want to highlight this. This is a NCHRP report 1561. It's applying climate change information to hydrologic and coastal design transportation infrastructure. So as a community, we're going to be looking at these things in the future. And this is a really good starting point. If you haven't seen this document, I would check it out. And I'm going to just make a plug. The National Hydraulics Engineering Conference is in Atlanta, Georgia, August 16th through the 19th. Um, there'll be a call for papers in, uh, here in February, but we'd love to see a lot of the input from this, this group in here um, at that conference. Um, and it's, it happens every two years, and it's just a great uh, um, organization. Transportation, ASHTO is putting it on, Technical Committee on Hydraulics and Hydrology, as well as well as Federal Highways. And then just continue to build these partnerships, right, uh, as, we, as we deal with resilience and, and uh, continue to coordinate and communicate on all levels. And then just another plug, make sure we know hydraulics is going to partner with you. There's only, I mean, just think about the reduction in the hydraulic unit from like 53, 55 people. We're down now to 35, right? And we're delivering more projects. We've got the IJ coming up. So we're going to need that partnership. So as, as Leah mentioned, stay in the flow, that connection there on our connect site. And then we've added some additional contact hydraulics here. And so and the clear programs also identified. So, and with that, I'll, I'll close and get open up for questions. Yeah, if there's any questions, we think about them and, and, and uh, ask them. I want to take just a real quick moment to um, thank my staff, too, especially uh, Matt and I think I saw Jay standing back there, but uh, Jay and Matt were working really hard during Hurricane Matthew, and then here comes Hurricane Florence. Uh, Chris uh, Warner called me uh, and said, well, what are y'all doing? I said, well, we're just sort of sitting around and waiting for the divisions to call us, Chris. And, uh, you know, next thing he told me back in about four hours, so the secretary wants to know which roads are going to play. Well, I found out later that Chris actually went to the secretary and said, what can we do, what can we do, what can we do? And the secretary said, well, tell me which roads are going to work, Chris. And so he asked us, and I said, that. And um, Jay shaking his head, we're like, that's nearly impossible with what we have now. But then that was the major disruptor, so I've uh, come to appreciate disruptors and, and all of the tools we see here. But with this great staff has, has created that. So really want to take a moment to, to thank you. And thank you all. It takes all of us to really put that together. Thank Allison uh, and her crew for putting together a clear website. We really encourage you all to use that because there are a lot of those uh, inputs to our updated guidance will need to affect other units as well. Let me step out of the way to see if there are any questions. There.
you got to check. You have to check if you're on post, right? Right. And I wonder, like, what 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 defines postal? Like, how, how far off the coast? Where does postal carry to? Uh, that's a good question. I think we put a, a map in the back of the uh, Postal Service Bulletin Board. Yeah. It is such a new uh, chapter, but I think we actually define coastal and, and basically it's something that would be highly influenced, obviously, too. Um, but there is a limit. Uh, I don't know if we actually define it as all Camera counties. Or have we, I don't think we call it. It is, well, we do have it as Yeah, I mean, it, I think what we did, Richard said, it, you know, certainly all Camden counties you need to take a look and see how much tidal, uh, tidal influence you have. I think we'll also want to look at that inundation tool that Matt talked about to see if you could potentially be impacted by future sea level rise and things like that. So. Okay. I haven't seen that yet. And I think the other thing about it, too, is. Um, Technically, it's live, but it's not really live, and I don't know how to describe that any better than that. Well, hidden right now. But I would say if you want access to it and sort of want to start looking at preliminary, just you know, let us know, and we'll give you a link to it. it. It is going to come out really, really soon. One of the things too is like chapter one. You know, I may just say a couple things about resilience in there, give a little, little bit of something in there. Um, I know we're getting close on time here. I also want to. You know, recognize Andy too uh, in our stormwater group. When I had alluded uh, to mention Andy before, but uh, you know, part of the, the things we were seeing in, in our early planning were sometimes things related to stormwater where we got much later in the process, we got down the road towards permitting, and we weren't, um, you know, maybe tapping some of our voice minimization efforts. And if we, you know, for whatever reason, maybe needed to. A basin or something that people will right away it's sort of a bad time to talk about it you know as you're already in the right of way stage so um, anyway this got a really solid group here and as you can see we're uh, we've come a long way from back in the day when we were arguing over hwv 1.2 and things like that and all the tools that are up here and when abdul was uh talking to jay about those plans just laying around there doing nothing there right there so um Anyway, just thank you all for being here today. Really appreciate your time. And uh, again, if there's other questions, we'll hang around a little bit and we have some more of those. But thank you, thank you for your time. I think this wraps up this session. Then.